Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this introduction to the U.S. Exim Bank, hosted by the Oman American Business Center in partnership with the U.S. Embassy in Muscat. My name is Fouad Aid, and I'm the Vice President of the OABC. I'm also the Europe, Middle East, and Africa Vice President for Champion X, an oil and gas services company. If it's your first time joining us for an event like this one, welcome, and thank you for coming. Before we get started, I'd like to inform everyone that this session will be recorded so that we can share this event with members and colleagues who are unable to attend. As we have many guests with us today, I want to take one minute to talk a little bit about the OABC and our vision and mission. The OABC is the official affiliate of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Oman and is also Oman's largest and most active professional business networking organization. We have a mission to foster commercial development between the U.S. and the Sultanate of Oman. The OABC hosts around 30 events per year, currently mostly on Zoom, but usually we have them face-to-face. -face. We connect executives in Oman and the U.S. in many ways and make it easier for people to do business. Today, we have around 160 member companies, including around 36 member companies who joined us or who joined our business community during the pandemic. Quite impressive. If you'd like to learn more about how to join or how we can support your company or your business, please get in touch with my colleague, Rebecca Olson. I think Rebecca is going to put her email ID on the chat window. So please contact her. This event has come about after the visit of the Exim Bank delegation to Oman in January, including Chairman and President Kimberly Reed. When we met, the delegation shared with the OEBC about the amazing and very competitive financing opportunities Exim Bank has to offer companies who are buying American products or services. And we all decided then and there to share this information with companies in Oman and throughout the GCC. So thank you, Rick, for your time today in preparing this presentation and welcome to all of those attending from other regional American Chamber of Commerce affiliates throughout the GCC. And now I'd like to thank the OEBC premium members. Now this slide usually goes up at our in-person events to give visibility and special appreciation to these companies. A huge thank you to each of these companies for being committed and active premium members of the OEBC and for sponsoring the work at the highest possible level. Your support helps to keep the OABC on the right track, especially in challenging times like these. And now for some housekeeping rules. We ask that you please stay muted while our guests and speakers are presenting. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation, so please uh, put your questions into the chat box and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can um, towards the end of the presentation. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I'd like to introduce our first guest of honor, U.S. Ambassador Leslie So, to give opening remarks. Ambassador So arrived as U.S. Ambassador to Oman in January 2020, having previously served as Deputy Chief of Mission of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem and in posts throughout the Middle East and in Washington. Ambassador we're very thankful for the incredible collaboration between our two organizations and for the hard work you and your staff undertake every day. We're looking forward to what you have to share with us today. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador So. Um, thank you, Fawad, for your very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here with everyone today. I also want to thank the Oman American Business Center for organizing this event. And I am particularly delighted that Her Excellency, the Undersecretary of Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Trade Investment Promotion, Asila bin Salam Al Samsani is participating in our program today. To her, I want to express my government's appreciation for her efforts to further strengthen the US Oman commercial relationship. And most importantly, thanks and welcome to all of you for joining us today for this virtual workshop, an introduction to the Export Import Bank of the United States. I wish I could greet you in person, and I hope the time is coming when we may be able to meet face to face. In the meantime, we have put together an excellent program featuring our expert speaker from the Export Import Bank in Washington, Mr. Rick Angioni. Thanks to Mr. Angioni for generously offering us his expertise and time. 
In January, then chairman of Exim Bank, Kimberly Reed, visited Oman to promote business between our two countries. During that visit, and upon the OABC's suggestion, the U.S. Embassy agreed to facilitate a webinar in Oman that explains Exim's programs and services. Today's webinar is a result of these conversations and of Exim's ongoing commitment to promoting international commerce by extending loans, commercial loan guarantees, and export credit insurance for the export of U.S. goods and services to Oman and other markets. As you know, Oman and the United States share a long and prosperous partnership bolstered by the U.S.-Oman Free Trade Agreement, which has been the anchor of our trade and investment relationship. In 2020, the United States and Oman traded nearly $2 billion worth of goods, supporting livelihoods for workers and their families in both of our countries. Buyers around the world value American products and services for their high levels of quality, ingenuity, and customer service. Exim helps foreign enterprises and governments purchase U.S. products and services. It supports exports of large and small U.S. businesses across many sectors, including those in the infrastructure, power, agriculture, aviation, healthcare, and technology services. Exim therefore forms an important bridge in our bilateral trade partnership that we are working to expand. Through today's webinar, we hope to promote greater awareness in Oman of Exim's products and services and to familiarize Omani customers with Exim's products. In doing so, we are looking for Exim to be a bridge for increased U.S. Oman trade and investment. Mr. Angioni will present to you some important information on Exim's programs available to Omani purchasers of U.S. goods and services. Let me conclude my remarks by saying that my colleagues and I at the U.S. Embassy welcome you to explore opportunities for doing business with the United States through Exim Bank. We believe that having more Omani entities take advantage of Exim products will advance bilateral commercial opportunities and increase prosperity for Americans and Omanis alike. Thank you once again for joining us and back to you, Fawad. Thank you, Ambassador. Now it's also my honor to introduce Her Excellency Asila bin Salim as Semsemi, Under Secretary of the Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Investment Promotion. Previously, her Excellency Asila led and facilitated a study on the impact of the fourth industrial revolution in PDO, which is Petroleum Development of Oman, in 2019. She led the development of the Turnaround Initiative, which became another successful story as it materialized to become the first strategic project aimed at localizing the turnaround activities in the oil and gas sector and enabling national capabilities in the relevant jobs in the Sultanate of Oman as part of the in-country value initiative or local content. Today, Her Excellency leads a highly focused team of people who are devoted to their mandate to increase investment in Oman and support exports from Oman to countries from all over the world. We've had the pleasure of meeting together and learning more about the great vision the new directorate has. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us and sharing your remarks. Thank you, Fuad. Your Excellencies, uh, lady and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a pleasure and an honor to be part of today's Exim Bank International uh, Buyer Webinar. First of all, let me thank Her Excellency Leslie, Ambassador of the United States of America to the Sultanate of Oman, and Mr. Ali Dawood, the Chairman of Oman American Business Center, Mrs. Rebecca, uh, Oman uh, ABC's uh, executive director and the center head, center's head of co uh, corporate relations, and Mrs. Lynn George for making today's events possible. We greatly appreciated the significant effort and the, and the considerable time you have taken to bring us all together today. Thank you. I would like uh, to also to express our gratitude to Mr. Wick, Business Development uh, Specialist and the Regional Director of Africa, Exim, for joining uh, today's session. We are honored to have you with us today and we're looking forward to hearing uh, your insight on enhancing Oman US trade as well as learning more about Exim Bank, suits of trade financing tools for international buyers 
of U.S. goods and services. Thank you all for participating. I am keen to discuss how we can uh, strengthen the trade ties, increase economic collaboration and benefit. This could bring our respective business uh, communities. In fact, in this, in this year, we are celebrating the 12th anniversary of uh, an important uh, milestone in our relations. The Oman-US Free Trade Agreement, a landmark signing that has opened up many outstanding commercial opportunities for our two countries. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today's webinar presents us with an outstanding opportunity to discuss many exciting possibilities that exist for U.S. business in Oman economic development. And we are eager to hear how we can better facilitate your participation in our growing economy. And with introduction of a new foreign investment uh, policy, we have delivered a better than ever a broad business environment, making it even easier to take an advantage for our outstanding business opportunity in logistics, fisheries, mining, tourism, manufacturing, and so much more. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I am excited about today's uh, today, uh, possibility in the discussion regarding our diversifying economy is opening up to our business uh, community and international partners for our export as well as for, invest for the investors in Oman. Indeed, we look forward to, ex uh, to exploring the opportunity of the MOU recently uh, initi initiated by our foreign minister, His Excellency Sayyid Badr, and the Exim chairman. For a particular interest are those opportunity for Exim financing in 5G wireless communication equipment, biotechnology, renewable energy, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing in order to achieve more export programs promotion programs and exim trade finance solution. In, uh, to conclude, I am very grateful to Her Excellency Leslie and her staff and Oman ABC uh, management for, uh, for organizing today's webinar and looking forward uh, to have a very successful session of today's meeting. Thank you for your time and I'm really excited about the, the details of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Mr. Rick Angioni, Business Development Specialist and direct Director of Africa in the Office of Board Authorized Finance at Exim Bank. Rick joined the Export Import Bank of the United States in March 2009. Rick has been responsible for developing Exim Bank's activities with Africa and is engaged in the development of the U.S. government's Prosper Africa strategy. In the 10 years Rick has worked at Exim Bank, the portfolio has grown its annual credit authorizations from 500 million in 2009 to over 5 billion in the fiscal year 2019. He's assisted in the origination and underwriting of both small and large transactions in over 44 countries across Africa. Rick previously served as director of HSBC in New York as part of the team responsible for export finance Rick began his international banking career on Wall Street, working with J.P. Morgan Chemical Bank, followed by positions at Bankers Trust in New York and in London. Thanks for your time today, Rick, and you're welcome to begin. Take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Faoud. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And I would like to take a couple moments to acknowledge uh, Her Excellency Asila and our great ambassador, Ambassador Su. Uh, it's really my honor to make this presentation and to follow Chairman Reed's uh, visit to Oman where she signed the $500 million MOU. While I wish I were there in person, I am pleased to join you via social media. Uh, today, I will be speaking about uh, Exim Bank and um, this is a, um, an exam 101. I will try to make it very simple because banking is simple and uh, 
Uh, I hope I can meet your expectations. Uh, please, next slide. <clears throat> So in speaking about Exim Bank, uh, Exim Bank is the export credit agency of the US government. Exim Bank was founded in uh, 1934, so we are roughly 85 years old. And uh, our mission is to finance US exports. Uh, what is important about also Exim Bank is that we have enormous capacity to lend our balance sheet is $135 billion, and uh, we are keen to support US exports uh, going to Oman and to the Gulf region. Next slide. So um, as I have mentioned, I, um, I, I, um, the, the mission of the bank is to finance US, US exports. Uh, this slide is to basically highlight, you know, the exports that comes to, to the region. Obviously, you could see that exports have somewhat declined over the last uh, three years. Uh, we are hoping for a strong recovery, uh, and we hope that the recovery will include significant investments which we can finance. In terms of exposure, what, what is interesting also is that the region is uh, critically very important to us. Uh, our exposure is quite significant, obviously with Saudi Arabia as being one of the largest exposures uh, and um, uh, followed by UAE. Uh, Oman, obviously we have a very small exposure, but clearly Oman is a much smaller country than, than Saudi Arabia, but there are a number of transactions and our pipeline is quite significant uh, that I see some great potential across, uh, across the countries in the region, including, uh, including Oman. Next slide, please. And Speaking about transactions, everything is about, you know, doing transactions, transactions that can generate economic activity and create jobs both here in America as well as in, uh, in, uh, in the host countries. One of the biggest transactions ever completed in the region was the Sadara petrochemical uh, complex. This was the largest transaction in the history of the bank at that time. Another transaction that recently has been completed, which is basically about the same size, is, uh, is in Mozambique, is Mozambique LNG, uh, which is roughly the same amount that we've authorized. Uh, we, are, we were very proud and we're proud of the joint venture be between um, Aramco and Dow Chemical. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And so as the um, ambassador noted, and uh, as our excellency also has noted, you know, we were proud of our uh, then chairman, Chairman Reed, uh, visiting Oman and signing a $500 million MOU. Um, clearly uh, this MOU, I like to think of it as a down payment because given the capacity of our balance sheet, we can do, we can do much more. But we are very uh, conscious of the uh, of Oman's vision 2040 and about enhancing economic uh, uh, linkages uh, and trade between Oman, the region, and uh, America. Next slide. So I'm starting now about speaking a little bit about Exim Bank, as I have mentioned. You know, Exim Bank. Um, uh, is a finance agency. We operate very much like a bank. Um, we, um, um, and, our, and I will be speaking about some of our products. I will be speaking about uh, a lot of C's, a lot of P's and, uh, and a lot of R's, okay? Uh, and what are the C's and P's and the R's? Basically the C's are, you know, the country content and credit the P's are people's product and price, and the R's are rich risk and return. You will notice in my presentation, I will be speaking a lot about the C's, the P's and the R's. So if you just remember the C's, the P's and the R's, 
I can, I can assure you that you will be much more knowledgeable about Exim Bank's operations, about banking, about finance, and about Exim Bank's policies. So this slide basically, okay, illustrates the programs of the bank. It's very, very simple programs. They're trade-driven uh, uh, programs. The programs of the bank can be divided into two, uh, two types. One are our short-term programs, and the other ones are medium and long-term programs. The short-term programs are primarily supplier credits. These are insurance uh, products where we provide insurance to US exporters that sell goods abroad, that sell goods to Oman. And in fact, what's interesting is that if you look currently at Oman, our exposure is primarily export credit insurance where we have insured receivables for US exporters selling goods to Oman. The other type of program is the medium and long-term program. These are, this is what I call primarily buyer credits. This is where we provide loans to buyers to buy US goods and services. And there are various forms of um, uh, programs that we have under, under this. We, have, we could still do medium term uh, insurance. We could do loan guarantees. We can do direct loans. And then we have some special programs related to project and structure finance, very much like the Sadara Petrochemical Complex, as well as aircraft is also a special program, such as our financing for, for Emirates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So you recall that I was speaking about the three C's, okay? So if you can remember the three C's of Exim Bank, I think you will be, you will have passed the test and uh, you will be uh, much more knowledgeable on how to work with Exim Bank. So basically, if we look at the, at the three C's, the first C that I'd like to refer to as, the, uh, as our cover policy or our, our country, we must be open in the buyer's country. So clearly, if you look at the region, we are open across the board. We're open in Oman, Saudi, Saudi, Bahrain, we're open across the board. So we are open to do business in these countries, okay? Content, very much, this is very much important that our, ex we are, our mission is to finance exports. So, so we pay close attention to Made in USA. So in order for us to finance exports from the US, certain content requirements must have been met. I will review the content, basically eligibility, but I'm not gonna go really into the weeds. I will explain that. And last but not least, a transaction has to be credit worthy. We want to make sure the, the transactions uh, meet reasonable assurance or repayment. We wanna make sure that you know, projects are sound. You know, as projects are sound, economic activity could increase and as well as jobs can be created, okay? Next slide. And so I was speaking about the first C, first C, you know, cover policy and country. So clearly, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, at, at this slide, you could see that in Oman, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, we are open across the board. That's not true about every country, you know, that we deal with. I am the director of Africa, and I can tell you obviously that there are many countries in Africa where the risk of doing business, you know, is very high. Their, their risk profile is high, and we are not open across the board. We may not, we may not even be open in certain, in certain countries. And in other countries, we may only be open short term. But in this case, okay, we are open across the board, short, medium, and long term, both in the public sector as well as in the private sector. Next slide. And so I was speaking then about content. This is the second C that I was speaking about, okay? Now, content is fairly easy from, 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 from our standpoint. The arithmetic is simple. At times getting to actually calculating and figuring out exactly what the US content is, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's generally done by a US export. But the arithmetic is very simple. And basically, you know, you just have to remember, you know, the, the formula that we have at the bottom, the asterisk, and the asterisk basically says that Exim Bank finances the lesser of, okay, 
85% of, of, of the value of eligible goods and services or 100% of the US content. So if you look, if we look at the slide and the calculation, you can see that the arithmetic, the arithmetic is quite simple. So if we start out with a US supply contract of 100 million, this kind of assumes that if we start out with a US supply contract of 100 million, okay, and then we have US content and eligible foreign content of 70 and 10, that means that basically then I'm saying that 20 million is not eligible foreign content and is taken out of the equation, right? Okay. So basically taking out that 20 million, which is assumed is ineligible for a content that we cannot finance, ineligible meaning that it was something produced abroad and then it was exported from abroad to Oman, for example, that would be excluded. So we would exclude that $20 million from, that, from the calculation. And we come to US content. Then we also have a definition of eligible foreign content. For example, uh, we obviously know you know, with the global supply chain that there could be in the US content, some foreign content coming from another country. And so that is allowed, only a certain percentage is allowed. So I am adding $10 million of eligible foreign content. So coming to a net contract price of 80 million, okay? From the net contract price of 80 million, we generally deduct, okay, you know, by policy, we deduct the 15% down payment, which is a requirement. And we come to the finance portion of 68 million. As part of our financing, we're also allowed, okay, to finance local cost. okay? It's not just made in USA. We're also allowed to finance local costs because as you could imagine in many projects, you have local costs, you have local labor, and therefore we are allowed to finance that. And we generally finance up to 30% of the net contract price for local costs. So obviously 30% of 80 million, you know, it comes down to 24 million. So the 68 plus 24 million or total financed amount could be as much as $92 million. In addition, we could finance, for example, because we do charge a premium for taking the risk, okay? we could also capitalize the premium as part of our total financed amount. Next slide, please. The next, the next slide <clears throat> basically summarizes kind of the credit that we're looking for, the third C, okay? And if we look at the credit, we generally look at the primary source of repayment. As I have mentioned, okay? Exim Bank is, a, is an export credit agency, but we are effectively a bank. We are a finance agency. And so, you know, and banking is simple. We lend money and we expect to get repaid. Generally, we have a counterparty that is the beneficiary of our loan. And the counterparty could be a corporate entity, or it could be a sovereign, for example, or it could be a financial institutions. Financial institutions play a critical role, for example, in financing commodities. Many of our transactions where we finance commodities are done through financial institutions. And so, you know, this, that could be an area that we can obviously explore also for Roman in, in potentially financing commodities, but that is an area that we can explore. But basically, there are three types of borrowers. You know, you have corporate borrowers where we, where we look at at the balance sheet of that corporate and the strength of their financials in order, in order for us to determine reasonable assurance of repayment. Similar due diligence is, is with financial institutions. And obviously, you know, sovereign, we look at debt sustainability, which if we look at the at Oman and then if we look at the, the various countries in the region, clearly we see them as low risk, okay? So our appetite for taking risk in the region is enormous, okay? Next slide, please. Here is basically, this slide is to illustrate a little bit more the specific products that we have, as I have indicated. Now I'm beginning to speak about the P's, right? You know, people's product and price, okay? And these are the, you know, the type of products that we have. And as I have mentioned, we have short-term uh, products and we have medium and long-term products, okay? 
the short-term products, for example, are primarily insurance products. Generally, the buyer doesn't even get involved in insurance. We provide insurance against the payment risk to an exporter without even the buyer knowing about it, okay? And there are various policies that exporters, US exporters have with Eximan, okay? Uh, where we provide this type of insurance, okay? And then we have the medium term, the buyer credits and the long-term uh, 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 project finance and long-term uh, uh, products where we provide guarantees and we provide direct loans. And also we provide structured finance products like, like uh, some of the projects that we've done in, um, in the Middle East that I, will, that, I, that I will discuss further. Next slide. And basically, uh, in speaking about short-term insurance, this is basically the example and the illustration of the various policies that an exporter okay, would have to insure receivables against payment risk. Okay? And clearly, in a classic example would be where a US exporter selling to a Nomani buyer, you know, providing credit terms, providing, you know, uh, 90 days or 180 days or 360 days. And obviously they may want to have that receivable insured. They may want to go to their financial institution and draw down under that receivable. And so they come to us under an insurance policies where we look at insuring at the credit from that or money buyer. So we do due diligence on that, on that transaction. If we like the risk, we approve the credit, okay? Those are basically, that's the basic structure of short-term insurance where the buyer doesn't even actually get involved in the process. Next slide, please. The next product that we have, and this is one of the biggest uh, uh, products that we have, is our guarantee product. Our guarantee product is basically where we provide a guarantee to a lender to advance funds to a buyer to purchase US goods and services. So why do we do that? The guarantee to the lender is basically, it basically the guarantee of the US government, is the guarantee of the full faith and credit of the US government. So effectively the lender is not taking a okay, buyer risk, is not taking credit risk, we are the ones who are taking credit risk. So the lender can pass on the benefits of the exims guarantee, which obviously represents the lowest cost of borrowing in the world to that, to, to that buyer. Under the guarantee program, okay, basically an application is submitted by the lender. It could be possibly submitted even by the buyer. Exim Bank, as I mentioned to you, guarantees 85%, we require a 15% down payment. The terms of the financing, because it is the lender providing uh, funds, then the terms of the financing are negotiated between the lender and buyer. Obviously we do review all of that, but there is flexibility where the, lenders, the lender does due diligence, advantage funds, the, you negotiate pricing and, um, and um, uh, the lender submits the application and does all the due diligence, okay? Next slide, please. <clears throat> the next, the next uh, product that we have is a direct loan. Under the direct loan program, this is where Exim Bank lends funds directly to a borrower, okay? Um, in, the, in cases where we lend, funds directly to a borrower. Generally, this is in very big transactions, okay? Um, our funding is fixed rate, is based over US treasuries, and it typically an international borrower submits an application to Exim Bank. Then we, there are certain requirements regarding direct loans, but I'm not gonna get into all of the requirements. But what's important is that in this case, unlike a lender under our guarantee program advancing funds, okay, it is Exim Bank who's actually advancing funds to the borrower, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> and this slide is to highlight, as I mentioned, 
the banking is 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 quite simple. Okay, as I mentioned, you know, banking is about you know lending money and expecting to get to get repaid. You know, but it can get very complicated, and they can get complicated when we are involved in doing project finance transactions. You know, and for example, in Saudi, you know, this would be a classic case, for example, of Aqua Power, okay, where they have been involved in a number of power projects in around the world, and, uh, and I'm fully familiar with some of their projects. But this is a case where it's project finance, it's basically limited recourse project finance. In this case, you don't really have, as I meant, as we discussed before, there are three types of borrowers. You know, you could have a corporate, you could have, you could have a financial institution, you could have a sovereign. In this case, actually, in project finance, you basically have an asset. You basically have a special purpose vehicle, a special purpose vehicle that is created by a sponsor. Obviously, the transaction and the project has to be sound. It is capitalized by both equity and debt, okay? And then you have a project that is supposed to generate some goods. In this case, it will be the example shows where power is generated and where power is gonna be sold to an off taker. And so the project is quite complex. And basically the project in project finance, it's, a Z, it's, a, it's basically a series of commercial contracts to ensure the economics of the project is sound, that the credit is sound, that the sponsor is strong, that the feedstock is there. This is, of course, got the government gets very much involved because it has to do a lot with providing certain regulations and approvals. So this is typically, you know, the structure of a project finance transaction. Next slide, please. And as I've indicated to you, project finance can be uh, can be complicated. As I mentioned, you know, it has to be, you know, as I've said, you know, the project has to be capitalized by debt and equity. The reason why we want we want to see equity in the project is because we want to to have the sponsor to take to take a risk, um, and that is a subject of negotiation always when we work with sponsors because clearly we would like to see them put in more equity and they would like to put in uh, less equity in order to obviously, you know, improve the ROI on the project. There are all kinds of credit enhancements as part of the projects to ensure basically that the project is completed. We are very much about construction risk. So we look at contractors who can deliver on the project. Next slide, please. And then repayment terms, okay? Now we're speaking about some of the R's. Remember, we're speaking about the R's. You know, I spoke about, you know, reach, reach um, risk and return and repayments. So repayment terms, it can go anywhere, okay? Our financing, as I mentioned, in the countries in the region, we are open across the board from short to long-term. And our financing can go from, you know, site letters of credits to over, you know, 18 to 20 years for a renewable energy project. Next slide. And our pricing, okay? The P's, no, pricing. So basically our pricing is really transparent, okay? You know, you can look on our website and you can see our pricing, okay? And, and this has to do a lot with us financing direct loans, okay? And our pricing is based on US treasuries. Obviously, you could see that interest rates are quite low and they remain and they, they they've been very low for some time now. But you could see that our pricing is based on US treasuries. Generally, we add one percent above the US Treasury rate that corresponds to that to that type of maturity profile of the of the loan. So you could see for an 18-year loan, for example whether it's in Oman or whether it's in Saudi, for an 18 year loan, okay, our pricing for that loan, the right loan, would be 2.28% current, okay? Of course, then we also have certain premiums that we charge in order to compensate for the risk, okay? Next slide. And the process, okay? 
Now I have simplified the process. You know, I like to keep things simple. You know, here I have simplified the process. Uh, it can get very, it can get a little bit complicated, but generally it's a five-step process. Okay, for us to to review transactions, okay, we gen we need to have an export contract. We need to have a a commercial contract between a buyer and the seller. Generally, before even the export contract takes place, you have exporters and possibly even buyers approaching us, approaching me, and asking us what our typical financing arrangements are in order to support that export contract. So generally with an export contract where financing is required, we could support that financing by an initial letter of interest or a letter of support, okay? If the contract is uh, consummated and, uh, and uh, the financing is of interest, then the next step is an application process. As I have mentioned, under the guarantee program, the, the, the US exporter or the proposed lender, because remember under the guarantee program, who's advancing funds is the lender. So obviously the lender is the one who generally submits an application to Exim Bank, okay? So under the Exim Bank, so, so an application is submitted. Under the direct loan in this case, the application is generally submitted by the borrower. What does the application include? The application is fairly simple, but it depends on the, on the transaction. If it's a project finance transaction, obviously it's much more complicated because you have all kinds of due diligence. You have legal due diligence, you have environmental due diligence. But if it's a simple export transaction, then you know we look at the contract or we look at the technical aspect of the project, and we review, we review the export, and we review the buyer, we review the credit, and then we that that would be as part of our due diligence. If it's if it's a question of a public sector transaction, and we may and we may need in this case, for example, Ministry of Finance approval, then we will also seek that Ministry of Finance approval. After all of that is done, okay, an application is submitted to the board. You know, you met Chairman, then Chairman Reed. It's, an application is, is submitted to the board. And I'm pleased to say that Exim Bank currently does have a quorum of, 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 of the board. Um, an application is submitted to the board. If it's above a certain amount, it's submitted to the board. Smaller transactions are not. We have delegated authority to, to support many of the insurance transactions but an application is submitted to the board. If the board approves the transaction, then it goes into documentation, okay? So then the lawyers get involved in putting together the loan agreements in order to finance the transaction. After the loan agreements have been, have been completed, generally you have a typical, you know, in a loan agreement, you have conditions precedents that have to be met. Once that the conditions precedents are, are, are met, our disbursements begin. Next slide. And so obviously there is an upcoming event. Obviously I'm very familiar with uh, Qatar 2022, but that's, this is not the event. Hopefully I can be there in person for Qatar 2022, but this is an upcoming event that uh, is gonna be a great event uh, sponsored by our fine colleague at the Department of Commerce. Uh, it's gonna be on March 15th and 16th. And, I, I, and this is on, on infrastructure. Uh, uh, one event is going to be uh, for the UAE, the other event is going to be for Saudi Arabia. Uh, it is free, so I urge everyone to sign up. Next slide. And this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick, for the excellent presentation that was very uh, clear and well laid out and quick. So we have time for Q and A before uh, we close the evening. And there's already a few questions here. Um, so I'm glad you have some water. <laughs> we'll get started with the very first one. Uh, do you offer any finance that complies with Islamic banking? This member is saying, I'm sure if you consider this type of finance that will increase again, the amount of finance. Yes, absolutely. We are um, we are very much familiar with uh, Islamic banking, and um, we also have um, close collaboration with the Islamic Development Bank. 
we uh, we have not done much of uh, Islamic banking, but again, you know, based on due diligence that we've done in the past, uh, we would be in a position to do Islamic banking financing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and I guess I should introduce myself. I've not been on the call yet. Everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Rebecca Olson, Executive Director of the OABC. Uh, and I have another question. How many contracts have been executed with Oman till now with Exim Bank? Right. <clears throat> so you saw the exposure, okay? The exposure, the exposure in Oman is currently very small, okay? Um, it's uh, roughly around 3 million, okay? Uh, compared to Saudi, uh, you know, almost 5 billion, um, 4 to 5 billion. Um, the number of transactions that we've done are primarily short-term insurance, okay? Uh, I do not have a number exactly of how many transactions have been done in Oman uh, since we have been operating, but um, the number of transactions are short-term insurance and uh, um, they're, they're just a few uh, transactions that we've completed uh, uh, given the amount of exposure that we have of 3 million. Yet, however, I would like to uh, say that we do have a pipeline of transactions, as I have mentioned, and I am, I am very excited about the pipeline of transactions in the region, which includes Oman, uh, based on what I can see, um, it is quite significant. I don't want to uh, say a specific number, but it is quite significant across a whole region in Bahrain, in Oman, in Saudi, I can tell you it is quite significant. And so we are excited about continuing our due diligence on some of these projects and then on some of these transactions. And in particular, Oman, uh, we are excited about uh, uh, some of the transactions that we have in our pipeline. Okay. Um, Great. So it sounds like they're in, in the process. Uh, very good. Then there's there's a question here about services. I think you've touched on this, but just to uh, confirm to everybody one more time that services can be financed with Exim Bank. Absolutely. Yes, services can be financed. Uh, that That's U.S. services can be financed. So it's not just about manufactured goods. It does include services. Um, you know, if you look at a project finance transaction, there are millions of services, you know, uh, that are provided. And those are all finance provided that they are construed as uh, US services. Okay, thank you. And then there's another question here. Can you explain the cash contribution of 15%? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Can you explain the cash contribution of 15%. Right, excellent, yeah. The cash contribution of 15%, I am pleased that you asked uh, that question. That is not so much an exit bank requirement, okay? That is a requirement of the OECD. Exit bank as an export credit agency is part of the OECD arrangement. The OECD arrangement is to make it uh, a level playing field among uh, uh, exporters who are members of the OECD. Um, and that makes obviously commercial sense, right? And um, so the requirement of the 15%, okay, is a requirement of the OECD, which we also implement. That does not necessarily mean that, um, uh, that an exporter cannot require like 20% or an exporter cannot require 40% or whatever, okay? You know, that's, that's a commercial decision. What we require is that we see evidence that a 15% down payment has been made. Now, at the same time, obviously, that 15% means that we are not financing that 15%, OK? 
Okay? But that also does not mean that a borrower cannot have a parallel loan to finance that 15%. We just want to see evidence that the, that the exporter has received a portion of that 15%. Also, that does not mean, let's say that you have a $100 million contract, okay? That does not mean that on day one, okay, on day one, when we start the disbursements, that we see that you have paid $15 million to that, to that exporter. It's generally on a pro rata basis. If there is a disbursement by Exim Bank of 10 million, okay, as part of that contract, then we want to see a corresponding 15% that has been paid, okay that we are not financing. So we would want to see that one, a $1.5 million that has been paid. That's what that means. Okay, thank you. Um, so when do the repayments, the repayments begin? That's a very good question. Repayment generally begins, it depends on the project and it depends on the underlying transaction. If it is a project, okay, if it's a project that as we discussed like Sedara Petrochemical, generally repayment begins six months after completion, okay? So you may have, for example, a project that it will take two years, three years to complete, okay? Okay, so the repayment would, would start six months after completion date, okay? Okay, so you obviously have construction, then you typically would have an engineer, an engineer that would certify to the completion and then repayment begins on whatever has been dispersed by Exim Bank, repayment begins six months from that completion date, okay? In a case, for example, where you have, for example, the sale of medical equipment, for example, okay? That could be a medium term transaction. Generally, repayment begins six months from shipment date. That's basically the difference, okay? Generally, we allowed six months, okay? But in a case of project finance, the project has to be completed in order to generate revenue, right? So we allow, you know, the construction period, okay, before repayment begins. In a case such as medical equipment, that will start generating. The idea is cash conversion cycle. The idea is when will this project, when will this transaction start generating revenue? In the case of medical equipment, it's gonna be put into use very quickly. And so it will perform its economic activity. So the repayment starts six months generally from shipment date. All right, thank you so much. There's another very good question here um, that says some of our products are made in Canada by our US suppliers. Can these be covered? The answer is no, because remember, the um, it's not even if it's a U.S. company that is that is um, manufacturing the goods in Canada, we will not be able to finance it. The, the requirement is basically that it has to be manufactured in the U.S. and it has to be exported from the U.S. Right. Um, in synthesis, that is the requirement. It's very much made in USA. Now we are, I should mention, you know, our content requirements are what they are. I have explained, um, uh, provided an overview, uh, but we are taking, um, as um, our excellency mentioned uh, and Ambassador So mentioned the MOU, and the MOU also dealing with some, you know, transformational exports. In that case, then I think if it's a if it's a product that we construe as part of our um, uh, mandate on transformational exports, okay, then I think we could take a more flexible view. So, so the the question is is good, but it really also depends on on the products. But clearly, uh, it's always has, there has to be some basis for made in USA, manufactured into into USA. Then it becomes a question of, of how flexible we can work with our content policy in financing eligible and then ineligible foreign content. So 
But in synthesis, the answer to that, made in Canada, the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being so thorough. I understand it's different with the transformational sectors and there's flexibility, but that's really helpful to know. Um, the same person had another question. What is the minimum size of any application for an Exim transaction? Okay, there is no minimum and there is no maximum, okay? As I mentioned to you, you know, it's very interesting that the minimum size, I like to give an example of fishing lures, you know? Fishing lures, um, you know, they may cost $5 a piece, but given that I deal with Africa, we have a great client in Africa that uh, buys fishing lures from the US. And the exporter, obviously, you know, the question may be for small transaction, why would an exporter, you know, insure a receivable, you know, a small receivable of fishing lures? Well, you know, they may not know anything about that buyer. So, you know, so, you know, in the case of, uh, uh, short-term insurance transaction, really, there is no minimum, you know, there is, it really depends on what the exporters want to insure, and they have various insurance policies, you know, uh, single buyer policies, multi-buyer policies, and they put everything under those policies. And there is no maximum, as I made reference to Sadara Petrochemical, where we have, um, where our financing was five billion, but clearly there's always, you know, you know, even though we also say we don't have any uh, country limit, but there's, but in doing due diligence uh, of credit, um, there is always some maximum. The maximum depends on the economics of the project and the maximum depends on how much US content is in the, in the transaction. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Um, the next question, and we, we have um, just three more minutes, actually. So what I think we'll do, if it's okay with you, you could drink some more water. I think I'll just close for those who need to leave. And then Rick has graciously agreed to stay on after six to answer the rest of these questions or any more that come up until around 6.15, 6.20. But we want to honor those who have commitments at six o'clock Oman time. And I just wanted to tell everyone, especially those who are here from other American chambers outside of Oman, that we're looking forward to one of our next events being a networking session for all of us to meet here on Zoom and go into rooms and network together face-to-face. Uh, -face. And that will be at the end of March on the 31st. We're working together with each country's AmCham to organize this. So thank you for joining us. For anyone who needs to leave, um, it was wonderful to have you. And now I'll take uh, the next question and I'll ask Rick. So the next question is, can Exim Bank help us to get a list of US exporters in fields of water and power development? Well, certainly I think Exim Bank can, but you know, the MCHAMs and uh, MCHAM Oman seems to have some really great people. Um, I'm sure they also can, I'm sure um, the, our embassy can or Department of Commerce so absolutely, I think if you could send a request that you could call our commercial, the commercial attaché at the embassy, you could reach out to me. I think we definitely, that is uh, something that we can uh, help you with. Excellent. And then the next question is about the general timeline um, for the process. I'm sure it depends on the size of the project, but is there a typical timeline for getting financing? Right. There is no transaction, no project is the same as you can appreciate. Okay. Uh, that I, I'll, I'll give you some, some ranges. Okay. <clears throat> On a large project finance, highly complex transaction, like the one that I was making reference to, uh, like a power project, uh, the amount of time could be as much as a year, a year and a half, at times it's two years. At times it's not even Exim Bank delaying it. Uh, it's getting all the information, it's getting all of the advisors in line, it's getting all of the lenders in line, uh, it's getting all the lawyers in, in line, it's getting you know, all of the you know, technical due diligence. 
And it really depends on how well an application is submitted, okay? So typically, a large project finance transaction, you could look at a period, you know, at a period anywhere from nine months to a year and a half or two years. On a smaller transaction where, again, I give the example of medical equipment, I mean, that process can take as short as three months, for example, you know, an application is submitted. Basically, we need to look at the balance sheet. We need to look at the contract and uh, we do the due diligence. So that, that's, that's very quick, okay? Like uh, that type of a transaction, a medium term transactions could take as short as three months if, uh, you know, if we, all the documentation submitted is there. In the case of a short term transaction, it's a question of days, frankly. You know, if you have, for example, um, um, you know, like, as I mentioned, a lot of the commodity driven financing that we do is done by way of a lateral credit. You know, generally who's applying for that insurance is a US lender. Um, that, takes, that takes days. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is quite specific. Would an operator for oil field or mineral quarry qualify? Would they require U.S. manufactured equipment? Our mission is to always finance U.S. goods. So if that operator is buying U.S. goods and services, uh, we can we, we, can, we can provide financing. Um, so the answer, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question, but, but remember our mission, we are financing US goods and services. So if that, the operator is buying US goods and services, uh, we can, yes. Um, maybe the, the person who typed it will ask further but perhaps they mean um, if it was a quarry um, operator, would they be able to receive financing even if some of the equipment perhaps came from somewhere else? Okay, so a, a quarry operator in, in Oman, for example, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a quarry operator could have, could have, uh, you know, a classic example would be, let's say, you know, a comp there are certain U.S. companies that, for example, in mining equipment, okay, some very big U.S. companies of which we are very proud of, you know, you know, Caterpillar, John Deere, um, and there are some foreign companies that have manufacturing operations in the U.S., even foreign companies that have manufacturing operations, provided that they manufactured in the U.S., and this and they sell mining equipment, we can provide financing. Now, that quarry operator, that doesn't mean that he must have 100 percent you know US goods, okay, in 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 you know in the mine. And I'm sure they would have you know equipment from all over, but our financing would be limited to whatever is US goods. I don't know if I answered the question, but. Yeah, so even if it is a US operator operating here in Amman. Right, yeah. Okay. Yes, if it's a US operator, the only time when we cannot provide financing will be if, it, if it's an intra-company transaction. If that operator, okay, well, let's say it's a US company operating in Oman, okay, if they are selling from somehow their plant in, uh, in the US, that would be construed an intra-company intra transaction. Under that scenario, we would not be able to do it. But if it's a US operator and we like the credit, uh, then yeah, we could, we could finance it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we just have about two more questions left. Um, says, thank you everyone for the presentation. I understand that identifying a US trade partner is required, but is it possible to pursue a pre-approval process with Exim when the US partner 
is still unknown. So they know they'd like to work with you. Uh, they want to find a partner and they're early in the process. Right. So it is typical, okay, that um, uh, under a, um, a bidding process, under a request for, uh, for proposals, okay, you may have um, buyers who have not yet identified, you know, their uh, source of equipment, okay? So in principle, you know, we can work, okay, with <clears throat> some Omani companies to provide some general indication <clears throat> uh, on the credit uh, of that Omani uh, company, okay? So there is, there is a possibility that we can I wouldn't I say that we would do full due diligence because yet, you know, a contract has not been signed and, you know, and obviously uh, we will not be, um, uh, we will not have all of the, you know, information to actually analyze the whole credit. But I think an informal process before actually entering into a contract or before identifying the actual US export or US counterparty, then informal process as to the credit worthiness of the buyer on Eximank's appetite for risk can be started, yes. Okay, great. And the last question um, may have been covered already in some ways, but perhaps you could sum it up again for our, uh, for our viewers. What forms of guarantees do you require to finance a project? Right, that's a really good question, right? So as I mentioned, we are a finance agency. In a case such as in project finance, okay, we are looking, we are looking very much at the risks, okay? And we're looking at the off takers and we're looking at the contracts, okay? Um, uh, those, in, in, in where, for example, let's say the, the, the project, you know, obviously it has to be built, okay? We may be needing, and we are concerned about the construction risk, we may be needing, you know, completion guarantees from um, the EPC contractor, for example, okay? In the case of a Balance, balance sheet transaction, remember a borrower is a corporate. Most of our financing, okay, is senior unsecured debt. So what does it mean senior unsecured debt, okay? What that means is that as a lender, we are senior, okay? But we are unsecured. Most of the project finance is kind of senior and secured because there is a lot more risk, okay? It's senior and secured. Most of the aircraft transactions that we do are senior and secured, okay? All the other transactions are generally we are senior and unsecured. That means that if we like the credit, risk, we're looking at the balance sheet, we like the credit risk, we do not need any more guarantees. But if, so we are taking the risk of the balance sheet. We're taking the risk that the borrower uh, can repay back that loan. In the case where we analyze the credit and deem the credit weak, okay, then we will need to have some credit enhancements, okay? Then we will need to find whether, you know, that the, the credit can be structured um, uh, in a way that um, it reduces the risk. In that case, we may need to look at a parent, for example, you know, that has a stronger financial uh, condition. Uh, we may need to look at a financial institution providing credit. We may need to share in the risk, okay, with the financial institution. So really, that's the answer. I mean, the guarantee, in the case of a public sector transaction, which I don't really see too many in, uh, you know, I see more private sector and that's the way it should be. It should be market driven. It should be the private sector creating jobs. 
But in Africa, for example, we see a lot of sovereign transactions because there's a lot of infrastructure and they need our financing because, because for, um, for Africa it is uh, getting access to cheap financing is very difficult. In that case, we see public sector transactions where the sovereign backs the credit. So that is the, the various scenarios of credits that we put together where you may need credit enhancement, where you may need guarantees, where you do not need guarantees, where you need to you know, mitigate some of the risks um, depending on, on, on the risks. Okay, thank you very, very much. You can see it's beginning to get dark here in Oman where I'm sitting. Um, what is the best way to, for people to start a conversation or to begin the process, um, would you like anyone from this call to, to email you or is there someone else that we should reach out to and uh, have them uh, contact that email address? Yeah, no, absolutely. You could have them uh, email me and uh, I'll, um, even though I'm engaged in so many other things, but uh, I will be pleased to provide uh, guidance, assistance in, and, um, you know, introductions um, to the right people. It'd be my pleasure. That's wonderful. Thank you again for your time. And you're on Zoom and our members are on YouTube, but they're all thanking you there for, for the presentation. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay, great. It's been uh, my pleasure, my honor, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.